Right, okay. Hello. You're all so welcome. And uh, and thank you coming for coming back to week three of So You Want to Write a Novel. And this week we're going to focus on dialogue, timeline, pacing, and writing strong emotion. And there's also going to be bits and pieces um, of kind of questions that don't really fit into any any particular um how would you call it category um and so the first of this is um somebody asked would you write under your own name or under a makey uppy name do you know i've never understood that question really i mean i was so desperate when i was started writing i was so desperate for like recognition or you know to be kind of praised in public I mean, I used to get excited about seeing my uh, name in the phone book. You're all too young to remember phone books. But like, it was something that really mattered to me. And, you know, when I started writing, I just, I really wanted people to know that I had done something worthwhile. But it's entirely up to you. I mean, if you'd rather have, um, as somebody called it, a makey uppy name, which I love, um, work away. And I mean, and lots of people write different, different genres under different pseudonyms so like whatever makes you happy um then somebody else said putting actual place names in um would you put in real places i mm, again it's entirely up to you but if you're writing about a particular small town um if there's a chance that you are writing about it in any less than positive or glowing sense it might be kind and it might be, what's the other word, um, wise, you know, to just not. I mean, I think big cities work away, no bother. But I think um, any small place that you could actually cause offence or, you know, even damage people's livelihoods or whatever. Why not just, you know, put something fake in instead? Um, oh, yeah. And so somebody asked, and this is such a good question. Um how are we dealing with writing about COVID times? You know, she asked me if whatever I'm writing at the moment, is set, is it set in 2019? It's, it isn't. It's set in 2018 at the moment. Um, and it is incredibly awkward because I didn't know what to do. Um, and I felt like I couldn't actually write a novel about, you know, 2021 as if everything is normal. I just don't think that's going to be allowed. Well, not a lot, you know, of course, everything is allowed. Um, but uh, I just think this strange hiccup in time is going to have to be uh, acknowledged anyway. But, you know, as I keep saying, like, do what you want. You know, you might have to revisit it um, later on, like if, if you decide you want to get published and, and if you do get published. But right now, if you want to write about 2021 and there being no COVID, do it. Or if you want to write it set in COVID, do it. Um, it doesn't matter at the moment. Now, somebody else asked, she is writing about a particular period of time and she wants to know, should songs and TV shows, should they be accurate from that time? This is a tricky one, I think, because the last book I wrote, Grown Ups, there were two concerts in it. Uh, the Spice Girls and Fleet Foxes and they were not on in Dublin in the year that I wrote. Um, I mean they had played I think it was you know the F Spice Girls had been the year before something like that and that is something that you have to decide. I mean the book before this one The Break was actually written it was based in 2016 and I had written in the Trump um, the Trump thing Victory and because because I was using a real timeline and I felt how could I ignore it but my publisher said to take it out um she said that it would date the book and I mean Jesus I was delighted to take it out anyway um because it just made me so effing miserable um and like nobody wrote in and said excuse me what's what's the story with the no trump um so you know it's up to you um I would err on the side of realness. I mean, I, okay, part of the book I'm writing at the moment is set in 2012. And at one stage I had them binge watching uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Then I realized, no, sure, that probably didn't exist then. And that jarred with me. Like things like that, things that you know definitely didn't happen. 
definitely wouldn't have been there then don't put them in but things that the, the, the person was actually talking about the six nations now listen i haven't a notion about the six nations uh, you know you, you could tell me anything and i'd believe it but if you feel uncomfortable doing it take it out and if you feel that you can be vague about it trump should never be included yes yes i absolutely agree i love that you oh thank you that i mentioned v buffy the vampire slayer thank you ha oh, that's so funny uh, loads of people are saying delighted about trump yeah me too um yeah so um right and somebody else and i love this question i think um uh yeah she asked me um how do i feel about writing sex scenes am i mortified well yes Yes, yes, yes. I mean, the thing is, especially with women, everybody assumes that absolutely everything we write is entirely autobiographical. Um, it was Mrs. Klopp who asked me. Lovely, lucky Mrs. Klopp. Um, yeah, everybody. I mean, there's always that thing. I mean, you know, sex is meant to be a private thing. Ish. You know, it depends, unless you're into org orgies and work away. But like, if I write about sex, I feel like everybody is going to think that this is exactly what myself and himself get up to. And, and, you know, there's, it's just very exposing. I mean, and I try and write different kinds of people having different kinds of sex. Um, and, I mean, if I write about anything sort of vaguely, you know, bold, like, I mean, bold isn't the word because... Because people can do what they want to. Consenting adults work away. But like, if it's something that I wouldn't do, I feel a bit, ooh, you know? And and I think, yeah, everybody's definitely going to think it's us. I mean, okay, I know somebody um, who wrote, somebody very close to me, wrote a book. Um, and in the book, the woman was walking up and down the man's back in red stilettos. Um, and I know these people really well. And it was very difficult for a long time. I kept kind of looking to see her shoes and looking at your man's back to see if he was kind of showing any signs of pain. I mean, yeah, but um, it comes back to that thing that I was telling you the very first night. Write for yourself. Write for yourself. Um, and try and write, write your sex scenes consistent with the character of the person you're writing about. Like, if they are shy or repressed hello you know they're going to be quite vanilla probably unless they get i don't know unless there's some kind of inciting incident that turns them into something else um and if they're more confident and if they've lived a little and you know do it y you know everyone's going to think it's you anyway so like just you know just 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 get get used to it but yeah, it comes back to that thing of like, keep it consistent with your character and pretend that nobody, especially your mother, is never going to read it. And then you'll be grand. Okay, now, we are going, I guess their sexy time thoughts need to match their voice and inner voice. Exactly. Consistency, you know, and it is all part of the characterization. Like if you did the exercises last week, you'll know that people have to align. All their stuff has to be aligned. You know, you can't throw unusual aspects of a character into another person if you get me you know people your own fantasies jesus i really want your friend to buy a red pair oh god no 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 red high heels for me thank you very much i'm grand no himself is a bad back it would never work and and i can't wear high heels anymore no 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 we're fine thank you right so we are going to start tonight with timeline okay now when you write a novel it can be set over an evening it can be set over eight centuries you know your that's your choice but whatever you choose your timeline has to be consistent and by that i mean in your head you have to be marking time as you're writing and somebody said it was joe Irwin actually hello joe that if that she doesn't know how to pace a book you know she's afraid of boring the reader and 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 then maybe going too fast and and losing them and would it help if she wrote a timeline from the beginning if it helps do it but i think be absolutely open to having to change it because i uh i think i mean i think 
to have a plan can make you feel secure. But I think people panic when their, their thing doesn't fit any longer in the plan. Your plan is only there as a suggestion, you know, it, and it can be, it can be uh, tweaked, adjusted, thrown away entirely if you need to do it. Like the book I'm writing at the moment, I knew something big was going to happen very early on, but I had no idea how long it was going to last. Um, the, 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 the timeline, I mean, something was, something happened Unravelings started in two different lives, but I had no idea how long it was going to take before there was a, a confrontation of, of sorts. And I'm like, I'm over halfway through the book now and I realise it is probably going to be about seven weeks between the inciting incident, which I've only just started using that phrase, um, I, I didn't even know what it meant, but to the, the kind of the, the shakedown as it were. And, and then there's going to be more stuff afterwards. But I am using an actual calendar from 2018. Like I can tell you where I am on that line. And for the first time ever, actually, I have got one of those boards. Do you know like that they have in police in incidents rooms, you know, where they have uh, where um, somebody said, oh, my God, did Rachel end up back in rehab? No, 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 no. But no, but uh, I, I like that you know it's about Rachel. Yeah, so on, on my board, I have index cards for every day of those weeks. Do you know what I mean? So I can see what's happening and um, and I can move stuff around or take things out, like if it no longer fits. And I've already had to rejig loads of stuff. And I think people panic when they realize they have to rejig stuff. And you don't have to panic at all. I mean, rejigging is part of it. Like it is, you know, most of writing, is it's about borrowing to get to the truth the truth doesn't jump out fully formed you you find it by trial and error and the trial and error is the actual work the trial and error is not what's blocking you from the work do you get me the trial and error is the thing um and and you will get there like i haven't planned any of my books and I haven't planned timelines for any of them. And they've eventually come together. But um, that would be my, my, my advice to you. Like if you're doing the 8th centuries one, like um, make sure you know what century you're in. If you're doing the one night, like uh, on, um, you know, Elizabeth Day's book, um, The Party, like that was over one evening. But you have to know exactly what time everything is happening at. You don't necessarily have to kind of um, do that thing of, you know, 2.15 a.m., you know. But now and again, you have to give a little hint to your reader about where they are. You know, you say something like, um, oh, you know, um, it was about three hours since they'd all said Happy New Year. So now, you know, it's three in the morning, you know, or um, the sun started coming up. And so, oh, my God, already she looked at her phone and it was only like 4.15, but like, oh, you know, early you know they, the sun rises early on Sunday sunny mornings a uh, summer mornings so you know you've got to you've got to hold your reader's hand from time to time without giving them something like uh you know a schedule for work um and uh on longer books when you are you know as I'm doing now like maybe over a seven week period like if things happen to your characters and Jesus hopefully things will you know because 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 that's how books work. But say if somebody gets, I don't know, we say a piece of good news. Why not? Um, you can't then jump to 10 days later, you know, to, straight into another scene 10 days later. You've got to put a little something at the start of that, um, that, that chapter saying, you know, the last 10 days had been blah blah or, you know, she was, you know, driving the new La 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 um, that she bought with the lovely money that she got from the good news. You've got to hold your reader's hand. There has to be an invisible thread connecting your characters every single step of the way. Even if your characters aren't on the page, if that makes sense. Um, signposting your writing, yes. There's something very frustrating about being overly cryptic. I mean, there is, there is, you know, like a lot of people, like I'm one of them, they want 
I want my readers to have a lovely time and I don't want them to be confused. And obviously, because I am flawed, I'm going to fail sometimes. But one of the ways I can try and be better is to do the timeline. I feel very strongly about about a solid timeline. Um, and it has, it's sort of, for me, it's the foundation stone. Not the foundation stone. It's like, you know when a carpet is woven? You know that the meshy bit at the bottom, like that all the wool goes into? That That's what it's, you know, your plot gets woven through the timeline moving along. If that makes sense. It's important. I tend to write books that span months, so I tend to use changes in nature, leaf, colours, etc. Very good. Yes. Lovely. You do have a lovely time. You're so nice. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Thank you. Okay, must be consistent. Keep checking back in with the reader. Oh yeah, I've told you about my calendars. Timeline underlies all plot, but I fiddle with it relentlessly. You don't need to have it plotted in advance, but you do need to plot it sometime. Like you do. Um, for yourself, the reader. The reader need no. I don't have a favourite watch. I love them all. Thank you. Um, okay, so that is timeline. I, I will come to some of your questions, but I kind of try and give general answers to all of your questions. Now, pacing. Pacing is not the same as timeline. Um, pacing is like how quickly do events happen? How slowly do they happen? And um, the thing is how, okay, I will come to flashbacks. Um, pacing, whatever pace a book is written at, you get to choose. A couple of people, again this week, talked about the magic formula, the secret formula, the formulae that, you know, that, that, that you need in order to write a book that will get published. As God is my witness, there isn't a formula. You know, I really think I'd know by now. I, there really isn't. And please, please don't feel that, you know, do I ever draw maps? I do. I do, actually. Um, and, uh, oh, Jesus, sorry, sorry, sorry. I kicked the, the holdy thing. Sorry, sorry. Right, okay. Um, right, right, right. Uh, pacing is like waves. Exactly. Yeah, you know. Um, so, in my opinion, you open with an event. Um, like, you hook people with something big, you know, and you establish at least one main player fairly quickly. Um, and you also... You have to establish stakes. Whatever is going on, it has to matter to somebody in the book, you know, preferably the person you're writing about. I mean, and this can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. You know, it needn't have any sort of moral value, but it's a thing and it matters to the person in the book, you know, and what you're trying to do is you're trying to tell your reader who the character is, um, but you don't drop blocks of information in this is my this is what I do anyway you do a line and then you're back to the action and then you do another line you know and just small I mean the things that people kind of worry about the most are like age um are they able to do this gender sometimes nationality um you know are they young are they old um uh let me see um so you establish as much as you can uh, under the radar, you know, um, you do like sentences here and there. So people don't really even know that they're getting information, but they're getting enough to know that this person is, you know, a woman and she's 57 and she's just kicked over her, her phone when she's doing an Instagram live and there's a load of people watching and she's embarrassed. Do you know, like, but I don't tell you all that information in the one go. It's, it's here because you have to keep things going. So that would be how you, in my opinion, what, what, how you would start a book. As somebody asked if you could start a book entirely without dialogue and just kind of, and do the telling rather than showing. It's entirely up to you. If you feel it'll work, um, show, don't tell. Very good. If you think it'll work, it's your book. I just know that like, I... As a reader, I like to care very quickly. Um, and if I don't, unless unless the, the, the blurb is really, really good, I don't know. Uh, drip feed, absolutely. I'm, I'm coming to drip feed. Um, yeah, this isn't drip feed. This is just kind of subtle drops of information. Then you come to sort of the next chapter. It's kind of like, that was the, the, the wave. Now, this is the, the calm. 
and you give information, much more information, but you would show the person operating in their normal day to day life, but they're carrying the the consequences of whatever happened in the first chapter, like they're going to tell you about what it has meant to them. And it, but they are also going to tell you what their life is like now. Now, um, not everybody is going to like how you pace the book that you are writing. Uh, some people are going to find it too slow and some people are going to find it too, too fast. And at the end of the day, you have to decide. There is no right answer. There is no formula, you know, of how many words you use to, to create the drama and then how many words you have for the come down. It's how much do you feel you, you want to give? How much do you feel you as a reader like what you have written? Um, and then we come to the thing of drip feeding information. Um, no matter what your book is, you've got to keep your reader intrigued you've got to, they have got to care and one way of doing that I mean there are many ways but like one way uh, is to create characters that they like but you are only going to give a certain amount of information and you are going to hold something back but let the right the reader know you have held it back but not in a nuh, nuh, nuh way do you know you've got to be careful do you know like you've got again listen it's up to you but just a tiny little sentence that might make people go huh oh more here um and no matter what you're writing there has to be a reason to keep reading and you just can't give it away all out straight out of the gate no matter what it is and I think the idea of, you know, something dramatic, then a, a lull, then, you know, more, more different drama in response to the first drama. You know, it's a really bad idea to have several, several different drama, dramas, you know, going on in your book. Um, you get kind of drama tedium after a while. I mean, I think one big incident and one big thing will usually kind of have a few fallouts like work with that um and uh hold on no there is more there is more there's more oh yeah yeah pacing again for me takes incessant fiddling i don't know do you remember last week i talked about when i was doing um or was it the first week talked about doing pl plot like i moved the chapters around like most you know pieces in a mosaic until, you have no idea the amount of time I put into that because I'd be reading and thinking, oh no, like we've had three chapters in a row here about her, you know, her domestic life. You know, I need, it's it's got too flat, it's got too dull. You know, those, those, those things about her domestic life are charming, but not three, just the first, sorry, hang on, does the big incident have to be in the first chapter? I... I wouldn't hang around. Um, I it doesn't have to be in the first chapter because I mean obviously you have a blurb that will that will hint at what it's going to be. But really, I wouldn't. I mean I'm talking about commercial fiction. You know what what people do is up to themselves. You know I mean I can't I can't thank you here myself with a load of questions. I can't advise on 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 other kinds of fiction because I haven't a clue. Um, but I. I really wouldn't waste time. Maybe not in the first chapter. Maybe you want to show them in their life, their their charmed life just before the storm hits. Um, but then the storm must hit. And then off we go. Um, now I'm going to try and get the, the things moving again. Oh, there we go. Can you have multiple dramas if working with multiple characters? You can. I mean, you absolutely can. But, and again, this is something that you can decide for yourself. Um, don't overwhelm your reader. You know, if there's too much going on, you stop caring, I think. It's just too much to take, no matter how well written it is. And again, I mean, I have written many books where I've had to cut entire strands. And it is agony. Like, it is agony. You know, because when I start at the beginning, I have no idea how each is going to develop. 
and how each is going to play off each other. And, you know, and I do get to a point and I think, oh, feck, I've overdone it, you know, and I give it to my editor and I, I let her read it and I'm like, I say nothing and hopefully she won't notice, but she notices and then I have to cut it. And it is trial and error. Now, for some reason, the things have stopped moving because I interfered. Roughly how long should a chapter be? It's, there is no, there's no amount. It, it can be whatever you want. There is no formula. It, it, a chapter should be as long as it needs to be to tell the scene that you are writing. That's all. It can be short, it can be long, it can be in between. But nobody is going to, to scold you. For it being the wrong length. Um, oh God, sorry now, hang on now. Eh, I've done something really weird now. Sorry, sorry, sorry. We'll just... Uh, grand. Uh, right. Okay, how long do you spend... It? We're going to do editing next week, lads. Is two incidents okay? If you think it's okay, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, two incidents. Yes. I mean, yes, of course. I mean, you know... I've never really understood what a subplot is. Um, I'll be quite honest with you. But what I think it is, like you have your main plot as, you know, as as you do. But then other people in the book have another plot. Um, you know, people related to the first person. And hopefully at some stage, you know, the, the two plots affect each other. I mean, they don't have to. But um, it's kind of nicer and tidier if they do. Hold on, himself is here. Is everything okay? No, I was checking if everything's okay with you because I'm. Oh yes. We're about a minute behind, so. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry. He was just checking everything was okay. Um, love fiddling. I spent hours on fiddling a few pages. I love fiddling too. Spending time with my book and just tinkering with it, playing around with it, not trying to actually achieve anything substantial, substantive in, in a day is just so lovely. Um, and you know, and I keep saying this to you, spend time with your book, befriend it. Um, uh, is five points of view too many dramas? No. I mean, I had seven, po no, yeah, seven points of view in, in, in grown ups. I mean, they were all written in the third person, but they were in the people's heads. Um, yeah, if you feel you can handle it, um, I like saying that, um, you can't handle the five points of view. Of course you can. Of course you can. Yeah. I mean, some people are just really good at juggling lots. Um, it's entirely up to you. Um, uh, the reader less is more for me. You see, it depends on the person. Um, now, uh, pacing, 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 pacing. Fiddling around. Um, move things around. Yeah. Yeah. Move things around. And, um, you know, do it for as long as you need um, until you feel okay there's there's a nice rhythm yeah you're looking for a flow like you're looking for an a comfortable flow and now and again you can have a you know a, a kind of a, an unexpected burst of drama like a, you know in every book I suppose uh, you know it has to come to some sort of denouement I know that's not how you pronounce it but I don't actually know that yeah it has to come to there has to be some kind of point where, like, it all comes together. Yeah, a climax, do you know? And, like, that's what you're working towards um, with your pacing. Um, okay, so pacing. Is that pacing? Right then. Now, dialogue. Okay. Now, as um, it was really interesting, um, there is no should, just be intentional. Yes. Um yeah any advice for weaving subplot into main plot in a meaningful way i mean that our editors are oh, sorry um i don't know i mean that's up to you uh i mean especially if the two people in the subplots know each other i mean you could i mean i mean of course but i don't know how to tell you uh Unless I had a particular book in front of me. Um, I mean, you could. I'm sorry for not being able to tell you how to do it. Uh, look for, yeah, look for the points of connection, I suppose. Look for the points of connection. Look for what the common themes in both subplots are. And see where they connect. See where they overlap. See what you can do in terms of mm, intersecting them. 
without too many coincidences. Like, I, I keep meaning to say this, no matter what you're writing, go easy on the coincidences, lads. I mean, one, I suppose, is acceptable, but none would be more acceptable. Um, the only time really I like a coincidence is when it turns out to be not actually a coincidence at all, when it's in like some sort of thriller where um, the accidental meeting wasn't actually an accidental meeting at all. You think, oh, good, good, there was a reason. Um, yeah, and somebody says, are editors authors too? I don't know what, I, 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 maybe some of them are. Yeah. Um, uh, I started a book where nothing happened in the first 54 pages, so I stopped reading it. I, I was rather bored. This is the thing. Um, uh, okay, but I'm going to go to dialogue now. Right. One of the questions that came through a lot and really surprised me is the, the whole um, dialogue in inverted commas versus dialogue in no inverted commas um, wars. I had no idea it was a thing. Um, a lot of people are saying that Sally Rooney doesn't write with um, with inverted commas. Uh, fair play. I mean, I don't think Roddy Doyle does either. And like, it is up to you. You absolutely don't have to put in inverted commas. The only thing that I will say is that if you find a publisher, and we'll be talking about getting published and editing and all that next week. If you find a publisher, very often they have house styles and they might be a house that would be aghast at the idea of jettisoning, jettisoning in the uh, inverted comma. They might be appalled. They might have a fit of the vapours and have to sit down and drink um, um, furnished branca and things like that to calm themselves. But I mean, definitely write it whatever way you want. And I can see that it's it's more it's pacier not to have the inverted commas and then a lot of people asked about um Deirdre Deirdre Sullivan asked um is it okay to write you know he said she said he said she, she said absolutely it is um you know because people do it different ways um instead of saying Look at the light over there, he said. Um, where, you know, and instead of saying where, she said, um, you would say where, she squinted in his direction. Do you know what I mean? So instead of saying the verb, she said, you would, you would, the next sentence would be an action of the woman's. So you're kind of, you're meshing dialogue and action together. And, but if you don't want to do that, don't do that. Um, now, another thing that um, people seem, people seem offended by he said, she said, he said, she, she said. If you're having a conversation between two people, you don't need to say it. Um, he said and see, she said, you, you don't. I mean, if it's a long conversation, now and again, check in and just let the, the reader know who who is still being who. Um, you know, if it goes on over a couple of pages. Um, but you, you can leave it if you don't want to. Um, and then another thing is, um, is it adverbs? You know, where like, uh, she said angrily. I know that there's an awful lot of kind of snobbery about adverbs. I couldn't care less. You know, I mean, sometimes it's nice. Sometimes it creates a bit of a an atmosphere. Um, you know, I mean, I suppose the hope would really be that you could tell that the person was angry from what they said. But if you want to fire in angrily, work away. Um, you know, then you might get an editor who'd make you take them out. And I mean, it's probably a hill that you wouldn't be prepared to die on. Um, but like, do it um, if you'd like. Now, so like the technicalities of dialogue. There were so many more questions on that than I, than I expected. But right now, I would think... You know, whatever you feel like doing, do it. Um, and can we all share himself? You can. Nothing like a good fiddling. Couldn't agree more. I'm. I'm just catching up on your um, your uh, comments now. Uh, right, right, right. Um, I find dialogue very difficult, very hard. Okay, right. We're going to talk about dialogue. Dialogue. It's an interesting one because, I mean, most of the time we're dialoguing. Um, you know, 
talking is so... Oh, what's the word? You know, it's it's how we survive. It's how we communicate. It's how we, you know, we express our wants and our needs and our desires. And, um, and I think, you know, as so many have, of you have said that you find dialogue difficult, that you find, you know, it sounds wooden. Um, what you have to do is you have to translate the, the substance of the sentence, you know, what your character is saying. you like, say they, they want to convey that they're not well. Um, and so if a wooden dialogue would say, I'm not feeling very well. But if, okay, it's a man and he's 37 um, and he's urban and he works in IT because everyone does, as far as I can see. I know you don't, I know you don't, but like, you know, I live a, a sheltered life. Yeah, and he would say, instead of saying, I'm not feeling very well, you might say, feeling a bit dot, 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 off in inverted, in italics, because that's how people actually speak. Um, people's spoken language is very, very different from, from written language. Like, I mean, language is constantly in flux anyway, but how we speak is a lot more relaxed than, than how we write. And what you need to do is listen. Um, and so, so many people say, you, you know, that they don't want to earwig or whatever. Do you know, I, I said this to you last week, Twitter, I follow a lot of young people on Twitter. Um, and I, I love how they talk. You know, I mean, I don't actually hear their conversation, but like they, they, they tweet in their, in their words and in the, in the rhythm of their speech. And I find that really, really helpful when I'm writing young people, you know, and even, even then, like, I'm not confident, you know, I have to get my knees, Emma, um, to, uh, to read what I've written, you know, it's, so for her to have a good snigger at my pathetic attempts to be down with the kids. Um, but again, your dialogue has to be consistent with the character you've created. I mean, definitely older people are easier to write because I'm older people. Um, you know, it, it very much depends on, I, I think the age of a person matters an awful lot. I'm going to come to different nationalities in a minute. Um, age and I suppose class um I even hate that word do you know what I mean I suppose maybe maybe economic circumstances may influence how a person talk, talks um their education perhaps but even though we can all convey what we want people speak in very different ways you know there are many many tribes um in in this in this English speaking world that I know of, um, and it is it's up to us as writers to to hear the different ways that people speak and to try and honour them, you know, respectfully without without making them caricatures or or without overdoing it. Um, I really think there's no need to go the full the full oh what's the word when. Uh, when you write as something sounds, oh my God, my poor menopausal head, somebody's going to tell me. Um, uh, oh, oh God, sorry. You know what I mean? You know, when you listen to how people speak and um, and then you can, um, you try and write the words. Don't do that. Um, but you could throw in the odd bit of slang or the odd bit of um, of of kind of, of a sentence where people often drop the I'm, you know, the, and they go straight into like, help you. Um, and yeah, listen, listen to how people, how people speak. Um, um, no, uh, actual dialogue, many people, nationality, each character. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Each character is an individual. So respect that. Um, yeah. So you have to translate the sentiment of the, of the sentence to the language of the character. Uh, pay attention to how people actually speak. I'm reading my own notes here. Listen. Okay. Vary your different speakers. 
Um, yeah, I'll tell you, I'm reading a book at the moment, and uh, at the start, there's um, there was a load of dialogue between phonetically. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Don't get the menopause. It takes away all your words. Um, thank you, Emer. Um, right now, where was I? Yeah, the book I'm reading. Yeah, it started with a you know a married couple, and they have some kind of very kind of abrasive sexy abrasive thing going on and the dialogue is fantastic and they're both very witty and they're both kind of um they're both uh you know arch ironic and i was loving it so enjoying this book and then there's a woman who's moved in across the road and guess what she talks exactly like them too then the man from the couple goes into work and guess what the woman he works with talks exactly the same way and now i am sad because because the author overused something that was really lovely. If the author had kept that kind of lovely arch ironic tone between those two characters and given different types of speech to the other two uh, so far, it would have been it would have been a different kind of book. But I've lost my trust. Do you get me? Um, and uh, it's a shame. It's an awful shame. So. If you find a nice voice that you feel, oh, Jesus, I love this. I'm really delighted. I've got this, this, this kind of type of speech down. Don't, um, uh, don't, don't overdo it. You know, just, just give it to the people, um, that, um, that have it. And then do it different things because there are many different tribes. And another thing that actually is okay to do is I think the way, you know, we you talk is probably the way that you would write most of your characters because it's our default it's what we think is um it's what we think is normal it's perfectly fine to give that to plenty of people plenty of your characters um you know uh just mix it up when you can but it's really okay to have people speaking hello christine hello sweetie um to use um to use regular speech just not for everybody texture oh yeah and what about texts between characters whatsapp etc can that be overdone no absolutely not no um you know i'd love to read i'm sure there have been entire books written um via texts and whatsapp and, and emails and stuff i mean look you know the way sophie kinsella does it um she uses a lot of emails at the start of the the shopaholic books and uh and uh, i really like it no i actually i love emails and stuff being used as a way of conveying information um now back to dialogue dialogue does many things um it doesn't just tell you what two people are saying to each other Dialogue is actually a very sneaky and lovely way of conveying information about other people in the book. Um, in Grown Ups, there is a there is a scene by a swimming pool where a young man comes in. It's Verdia, and he jumps in the pool, and he's looking he's looking fabulous, you know. And I think that was kind of the turning point for Ferdia. Um, uh, and there is somebody there who has their who suddenly has their eye on Ferdy. I'm trying not to do a spoiler. However, the person who said that Ferdy looked beautiful was Ed. Ed said, "Oh my God, I suddenly feel really inadequate." And the children, like Bridie and uh, Dilly, were suddenly all over Ferdy, and they were doing um, the talking about him, and so. Ed's dialogue and the children's dialogue was a great way of letting the reader know that actually Ferdia is right. And you can do that with dialogue. Um, and so it's um, grown-ups that I'm talking about. Twi Any side of the twitchy Mickey? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, so use dialogue. It's a trick that I like um, because if the person that I was interested in, if she that person had noticed it, it would have given it away too soon and I'm glad it didn't. Uh, yes, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah, now slang, work away, absolutely work away. I mean, I love slang, like I love to read dialogue that sounds like real conversation. And then I saw um, 
somebody going past and they said, uh, uh, what about um, swearing? I mean, again, it's up to you. Again, people swear. I mean, again, as an Irish person, I adore it because words, it, you can have a sentence that's missing a word in the rhythm, do you know? But if you throw in a lovely feckin, suddenly you have it, it's, you know. And um, But then there are a lot of people who don't swear themselves and they don't want to write characters who do. And that's entirely up to them. And then there will be people who will be offended. But as is, um, you know, and I don't want to offend. I don't upset people. And it's a balancing line. I don't swear as much in my books as I used to. That, that That's definitely the case. I mean, maybe because I personally don't as much um uh hold on is it okay to say said marion or exclaimed marion whatever you like whatever you like um you know i like an exclaim i mean you could do it with um with an exclamation mark rather than uh rather than um uh actually saying exclaimed but yeah come coming back to the swearing that's a personal choice and, you know, you can put it in and take it out, like, uh, as the uh, bishop said, sorry, um, <laughs> sorry, uh, um, dithery effects. Yes, yes, mammy keys. Yes, gobshite is a wonderful word. Um, but, you know, you could put it in your first draft and then if you felt a bit you, that you want to take it out, take it out, you know, like do it. Um, like at this stage, this is just about enjoying yourself and... Um, Anything is fixable. Anything is changeable at this stage. Now, I am going to... Hang on, have I done? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. If you are writing accents and... Um, and I think it's something that has to be probably not done. Um, especially... Okay, it's about an imbalance of power. Like if I, as a white person, I'm writing about the accent of a person um, who is in Ireland um, trying to earn a living, um, it's not appropriate for me to write in their accent. Okay, himself has just come in and told me 50 minutes, but I'll keep going because I have to do the writing strong emotion. Um, and, you know, it's just not on, I think. Um and, and, and to my shame and my earlier books, like it was 20 years ago, but I wish I hadn't. I wouldn't I wouldn't put in accents at all now if there is any kind of imbalance of power. Um, I think like the occasional word, if you're writing about something like, you know, sometimes people write books that are set in France, but everything is in English, you know. But sometimes they'll throw in the odd ma chérie to let you know like that it's still French. I think that's okay. But anything that would seem in any way to be making fun of people whose, whose first language is not English, um, let's not. Let's be kind, you know, and let's mind the, the, the most vulnerable in our lands rather than push, push it, put them in any kind of uh, situation where fun could be made of them. Um, so... I hope that that helps you with the dialogue. But yeah, back to the dialogue. Just listen, listen, listen. Listen in your head to how a person would say something. Um, and then try and recreate it. And like anything, just fiddle with it until you get it right. Now, writing strong emotion. Now, will you hold on until I find me notes? Strong emotion. Okay, right. This is all, you know, it's another arm of characterization. Um, what I had to learn um, is that everyone is unique and that not everybody is like me. I thought everybody felt pain the way I did, which is like everything is devastation, everything is catastrophe. And that's not the case. And one of the lovely things about writing has been creating people who are a lot tougher than me, um, like like Jesse in Grown Ups or like Jojo Harvey in The Other Side of the Story. And so when a person has been hurt, um, the, I, I mean, I think my immediate go-to was like, how would I feel? And then it's like, I actually don't count in this. You know, how how would they feel? And it is nice to know that ev not everybody, I mean, I'm not a shouter, I'm more of a kind of a, <gasps> you know, but a lot of people go very quiet, you know, or a lot of people step away. Um, a lot of people display anger by like, 
I don't know, like slamming a door, you know, by like flinging a cup at the wall, like something like that. Um, and I've written careful now next to melodrama, you know, dial it down. Um, a bread and buttered. Somebody just wanted to know how bread and buttered was that. It's a Dublin accent. Um, yeah. Err on the side of quiet fury rather than screeching and shouting when something goes wrong. And I've written on my notes here, characterization is vital here. Whatever a person does when they re react to strong emotion has to be consistent with the character you've created. And, um, and so I think kind of unhinged fury is more rare than I realized. I, and I mean, I think most people outside of their own home anyway, have learned to be careful in public. Um, is it a bad idea to use a character that is not of the same race or sexuality to you? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. There is so much talk about appropriation. And the last thing I want to do is offend people, hurt people, um, do anything that I could, um, that could in any way cause harm. So, I mean, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I mean, I suppose that it's not up to me to decide. Um, it would be up to people of the different race or the different sexuality to you to tell you. Um, I think actually my opinion really, I can't say yes because I have no right to. Um, so, uh, hold on now. That was Irina. Oh yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, it is a tough one and times are still changing. Yes, thank you. That's one that I'm uncertain about at the moment and I hope will become clarified. And I hope that we can all, um, you know, mind, be, be mind, be careful of people, be kind to people. So anyway, Jesus, it flew. I hope that this is helpful to you. Um, so now next week is going to be on kind of the business end. You know, we're going to talk editing. We're going to talk agents. We're going to talk publishing, like that sort of thing. And um, but like anything else that I haven't covered in the in the last um, three weeks, Please let me know. And if I know the answer, I will um, thank. Oh, there's somebody, something called a sensitivity reader. I, could you let us know how we would how we would find the sensitivity reader person? Um, uh, and um, yes, thank you. Um, yeah. So there'll be a new challenge up tomorrow um, and uh, we'll see how you get on. But like the challenges are only for fun. Don't do it if it stresses you. And go into it knowing that nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to mark you. This is about you having a lovely time. Night, night, angels. See you next week.